Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. So, um, from our first two speakers, we've heard, we've been getting some, some sense of why caring for the soil is important both environmentally and economically. And one factor that we can zero in a little bit more on, which um, Dr. <coughs> Nichols was, was looking at a bit, is water. Water problems like floods and droughts are a huge concern throughout the country and throughout the world. To a large extent, how we're able to meet our water challenges, whether an epic flood means millions in disaster relief, or whether a river stays within its banks, turns on how we manage our soil. And this is why. Living, carbon-rich soil is a sponge. Now here is a st statistic that puts this in perspective. Every 1% increase in soil organic carbon represents an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre that can be held on the land. Now think about that, that's a lot of water. Okay, 20,000 is an average, I've heard 16, I've heard 27, but basically a lot more water can be held on the land. This means that the land maintains moisture in times of drought and crops can last longer between watering. I think one of your slides did suggest that. And with all that water soaking into the soil, it's that much harder to make a flood. We can think of soil as our water infrastructure. This works on two levels. First, there's the surface of the ground. If soil lacks plant cover, whenever it rains, the surface seals over and water streams away, carrying away precious topsoil along with whatever pollutants are in the pa its path. With bare ground, falling raindrops batter the soil. I know that we think of rain as mild and nourishing, but seen under the microscope, rain striking exposed earth is a kind of violence. Particles flying upwards like shards of glass leaving empty craters. Soil covered by plants or mulch is sheltered so that the water can kind of gently be absorbed by the land. And again, it's worth mentioning that a lot of our agricultural practices today and conventional agriculture involve stripping off in ha during the harvest and leaving soil bare for most of the year. So that means that that, the, that, that land does not, is not supporting photosynthesis. It doesn't have plants that are photosynthesizing. And the way that um, a colleague of, of ours, Peter Donovan, describes this land, this non-photosynthesizing land, is as sunshine spills. So kind of like a corollary to an oil spill, meaning that it's, it's wasted. It's a wasted opportunity. On a zoom lens level, we can see water infrastructure in the soil aggregate. Okay, so when, when, if, you, if you take a, a handful of soil and it crumbles, you know, when, when you know that soil is healthy and it crumbles, it kind of falls into little pieces, those are soil aggregates. And that's a lot where a lot of the action occurs. That's where all those earthworms, well, maybe, yeah, earthworms are too big, but you know, that all the bacteria and the fungi and all, like that's where a lot is happening and there are pore spaces so it's like a really biologically active entity the soil aggregate well aggregated soil has pore spaces for water to linger and filter through replenishing underwater <coughs> underground water stores so what we see as water problems can also be understood as a failure to keep water on the ground problems. And we can address this by tending soil, making sure that it doesn't degrade to lifeless dirt. When we consider floods and droughts, we tend to frame it in terms of what does or doesn't come down from the sky. This leaves the impression that we're at the mercy of the elements. What ultimately matters, however, is what happens to precipitation where it falls. For there are places that remain in a state of drought no matter how much it rains. Conversely, with good management, areas with little rain can be very productive. 
A shift in our attention from the rain gauge to the state of the soil gives us tremendous agency. Specifically, it draws attention to the many ways we can enhance soil's ability to retain water, thereby offering resistance in the face of flooding and dry skies. One thing that we in this country haven't really grappled with is land degradation, which though largely invisible to the US public, is the underlying reason for many water-related problems. Instead, we respond to symptoms, putting out sandbags and draining our aquifers for farm and city water. Degraded and desertifying land is a story written across our nation and around the world. And when Dr. Nichols referred to the potential for conflict, I think it's worth noting that many global conflicts, if you look at them, they're behind the geopolitical dis um, factors, there are water shortages. And behind the water shortages, there are there is land degradation. And it's worth also noting that many of our high conflict regions are in drylands, specifically seasonal drylands, which in which it's, it's very easy for the land to degrade unless there's appropriate management. So we can restore function to e even large degraded landscapes. Again, the solution is in the soil. And the first book I, I wrote that Alexis mentioned is called Cows Save the Planet. And the, that it, and it's, the title is a nod to holistic plan grazing, which is one of the ways to restore large-scale ecological symptoms, uh, systems. And just I think it's, you know, we can talk about this more, but I just think it's worth putting out there that there's a lot to be said about the keeping the animals on the ground, because an, the managing animals appropriately is a big factor in these seasonal drylands, these conflict vulnerable areas, keeping moisture on the ground, in the ground, and keeping the systems going and ensuring food production, etc. As a journalist, I've had the chance to meet farmers, ranchers, and urban dwellers that focus on soil and water-wise, they see dramatic results. In Zimbabwe, thanks to organic matter from livestock, rural villagers have been able to get off international food aid and the river in the, near the village no longer floods. In the Great Plains, a better sponge has meant water for wetlands, well, what they call prairie potholes out there, which supports greater biodiversity. As Singing Frog, Frog's Farm in California, a sudden downpour ruined a neighbor's entire crop. Singing Frog's, which uses no-till, didn't suffer any loss. We all need food and water, and we all live downstream of someone else's land. So these ways of restoring soil and building our, our carbon sponge, these are all opportunities that we can benefit from. Thank you.